get, your, get to your seats and uh, we're going to be calling the meeting to order in about uh, 15 seconds. Thank you. Uh, may I ask before we start, um, who, do, who do we have on the phone? If you could just give me your first name so that we know you're there and who to look for. This is Clay. Clay Johnson. Thanks, Clay. This is Andrew. This is Maggie Mulvihill from Boston University. This is Dave Barr from Eugene, Oregon. And Andrew Becker calling from Washington State. Great, thank you. I think we've got one more member who's going to be calling in, but um, we've just about got a full contingent. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jay Basanko. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the National Archives, and it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, for this first meeting of the FOIA Advisory Committee. The National Archives has a unique role among federal agencies, which we often describe as preserving the past to protect the future. If you have time after today's meeting, I encourage you to explore the records we have on exhibit in our museum, including a fascinating display of the most interesting signatures in our holdings and the stories they tell. Making their mark is located in the O'Brien Gallery and will be on display until January of 2015. As a nation's record keeper, NARA's role goes beyond preserving and displaying historical records. We also provide leadership on managing and organizing the records our government creates every day and making them retrievable through mechanisms like the Freedom of Information Act. The FOIA has provided the public with the right to access government records for nearly 50 years. And like anything that has been around for decades, FOIA continues to benefit from regular improvements, such as the types of legislative, executive, or policy improvements that this committee might suggest. And it's important to note that FOIA administration and its process is not something that is, or should be, entirely government run. It is a partnership between government agencies that implement the law and policies and the requesters who use the law and policies and can inform government where we can make improvements. We worked hard to convene a committee that is reflective of the broad array of audiences that it must serve. Your diverse backgrounds and interests will be essential to crafting a new and better future for this important program. We appreciate the opportunity to provide a home for this committee and look forward to sharing what we have learned through our work as you discuss the future of FOIA and to learning from all of you as well. We want to thank you all for agreeing to serve on this committee. We know how valuable your time is, whether you traveled across town or across the country or joining us on the phone today. Thank you for your service. Now I'd like to introduce somebody who to this uh, group likely needs no introduction, Miriam Nisbet, the chair of the FOIA Advisory Committee. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay, and good morning, everyone. Um, we're really delighted to see uh, such a nice turnout. Um, we have uh, quite a few people um, registered besides uh, those who, who have already uh, arrived. I think we might have a few more uh, latecomers. So um, just a, a welcome to you all who are here and um, we'll be continuing to see people come in, I expect. Um, this is a very exciting time <laughs> for FOIA. Um, we are um, very pleased with this committee to be part of a process um, that certainly started before, uh, before the last uh, year or a couple of years. Um, many of you have been involved for a very long time, um, interested in FOIA, making suggestions about improving FOIA, 
um, being part of the process through making requests, um, through processing requests, through uh, looking at policies uh, of the government, and this is a continuation of that. But very specifically, we are part of a process that relates directly to the U.S. government's National Action Plan for Open Government, for the Open Government Partnership. Um, that is a plan, uh, the second version of which was announced last December. Uh, there were five commitments to uh, improving the Freedom of Information Act, and um, uh, this advisory committee was one of those five commitments. Um, as Jay mentioned, the National Archives Thank you, Corey. The National Archives and Records Administration is a really um, uh, a, na a natural home for an advisory committee that is studying, looking at FOIA, and making improvements to it. Um, the Office of Government Information Services, uh, which launched um, just about five years ago, a uh, fifth year anniversary coming up in September, um, has a, a mission uh, to provide mediation services. Some of you have taken advantage of those services um, or will take advantage of them, I, I hope. Um, and also to review agency FOIA policies, procedures, and compliance and recommend improvements. So it's really um, that mission, the mission of the National Archives to provide access to um, to government information, uh, the core mission. Uh, the mission of OGIS um, really dovetails beautifully with the mission of this advisory committee. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, before we get any further, is to have everyone, um, all the members, introduce themselves. Um, and I'm going to ask you to do that in a very brief way. Um, if we had everyone explain uh, their paths to uh, this meeting today, uh, their history with FOIA, um, I think that could take up uh, a very good part of the meeting time. So um, what, we would, what I'd like to do is ask for people to introduce themselves by their name, uh, the position they currently hold, and certainly as our meetings go on, remembering this is a two-year process, um, I think um, people's uh, connection with, their interest in, their experience with the Freedom of Information Act will, um, will come through um, through our discussions and our deliberations. Before we do that, I do want to just remind everybody we are um, being videotaped um, and the uh, recording as well as a transcript of the meeting will be available to the public uh, within hopefully within about a week um, that will be available on the OGIS website where we have all of the meeting materials available um, and um, so for people who are not going to be with us today uh, they'll be able to follow um, our proceedings over the next uh, several hours so Let's start with, our, um, start with our members. I will note that we have two members, um, Dolores Barber from the Department of Homeland Security and Michelle Meeks from uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, who are not able to be with us today because of previous commitments. Um, we are delighted that we have um, 18 of the 20, though, here in person or on the telephone. So let me start with the people who are on the telephone. Um, and um, ask you to um, introduce yourselves. Um, and I think if we just go in alphabetical order, uh, we would be starting with Dave Barr. Are you there, Dave? I am, yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry that I'm appearing by the phone uh, rather than there in person. I look forward to meeting you in person uh, at some of the following meetings, but uh, <clears throat> Just very briefly, I, I am a, I'm a lawyer. I represent requesters uh, seeking information from the government, either state or federal, all around the country. 
and um, and I, I, I hope that I can illuminate some of the issues and, and concerns that arise in that context uh, for in this process to try and make the FOIA operate better uh, for all involved. Thank you, Dave. Andrew? Andrew Becker? I know you were there earlier. Okay. We, we'll see if Andrew will, uh, we'll see if um, I'm going to ask uh, maybe one of our uh, OGIS staff members to send an email or a text to Andrew and see if we can get him back on the phone. Clay, I think you're next. Oh boy. Hey, I'm sorry, here I am. Are you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, sorry. Good uh, morning, Clay. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, um, uh, studiously muting myself because uh, at home with a two-year-old who desperately also wants to participate in the federal <laughs> advisory <laughs> uh, ad, but, um, but uh, Andrew, I, think uh, I might be the only one who can understand him. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Clay Johnson. I'm with the Department of Better Technology and, um, you know, a big fan of everybody's work. Thanks very much for having me here. Thanks, Clay, and thank you for that reminder. For people who are on the phone, if you could uh, mute except for when you're talking, that would help. And uh, welcome to Clay's two-year-old. I'm sure uh, this is a good civic lesson. Maggie? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Maggie Melta Hill, and I'm a uh, professor of journalism at Boston University. And I'm interested, and I'm also a lawyer. Um, I'm interested in how we teach FOIA at higher at the higher education level, and um, also how we use technology and data um, to to look at how the federal government works. And I'm really, I'm absolutely elated to be included. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to meeting everyone. Thank you, Maggie, and, and hopefully we'll have you in person at another, at, an, at a future meeting. Of course. Um, do, uh, do we have Ramona on the phone yet? Okay, uh, Ramona Oliver from the Department of Labor um, also um, is um, going to be calling in. She had a conflict that did not allow her to be here in person, and uh, hopefully we will hear from her uh, before, before long. So um, let's start with those at the table, and I'm going to ask Jim Hogan, and then we'll just go around the table here. I'm Jim Hogan with the Department of Defense, uh, Freedom of Information Policy Office. Hi, I'm Ginger McCall with the Electronic Privacy Information Center. I'm Associate Director of EPIC and Director of EPIC's Open Government Project. I'm David Reed. I'm Assistant Chief Financial Officer at the Federal Communications Commission. I'm Lee Wine. I'm the Executive Director of the National Coalition for History. Melanie Paste, I'm the Director of Office of Information Policy at Department of Justice. I'm Eric Gillespie, and I'm the CEO of a company called Gavini. Miriam Nisbet, National Archives. Uh, Nate Jones, National Security Archive, which is a non-government FOIA requester. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Finnegan. I'm a Deputy Chief of uh, a division at the State Department that handles FOIA policy and FOIA litigation. Mark Zaid, I'm an attorney here in D.C. and the executive director of the James Madison Project. Hi, I'm Marty Michalowski. I'm the FOIA manager at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Ann Wiseman, I'm chief counsel at Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. And Larry Gottesman, the agency FOIA officer at the Environmental Protection Agency. And um, I'm just going to mention that Kirsten Mitchell, who is at the end of the table to Larry's right, 
is a staff member uh, with the Office of Government Information Services, and she is going to be taking notes this morning um, to help us fill out um, the record of this meeting. So Kirsten doesn't have a microphone over there, but thank you, Kirsten, for being willing to be our note taker. And um, again, um, welcome to those of you who um, have arrived. Um, we are delighted to have you here at the first meeting of the FOIA Advisory Committee. So let me um, take a few minutes to talk about uh, some ground rules, some housekeeping, some expectations, if I could. Um, so now that we are all gathered, I do want to let you know that we are going to take a break at some point. Um, we will take a 15-minute break. Uh, we're going to be aiming for doing that at around um, 1120, so just uh, slightly more than an hour from now. Um, and uh, we will uh, have people who can help point you to uh, the cafe, which is uh, two levels down in case you want to grab uh, a cup of coffee or uh, a bite to eat. Uh, there are restrooms on that level as well. Um, and there are also restrooms available to you at one level down where you entered this morning um, on the ground level. There are restrooms in the research room and you are, um, you are free to use those as well. Um, I mentioned before, um, all of the materials for this meeting are available on the OGIS website. Um, there is a handout. I, I'm, seeing the, I'm seeing the handout in people's hands. So um, just note that on that handout is the URL for the OGIS website where the committee materials um, are housed and will be housed as we go along. Um, we will be having um, meetings um, up to four times a year, um, and uh, we have picked some tentative dates to roughly correspond with the date of this first meeting, so we've aimed for um, sort of the, 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 the Tuesday of um, the third week in um, every three months from now. Um, we have listed those dates on the handout and provided them to the committee members. Um, we know that not everyone is going to be able to make um, every single one of those dates, but we, we you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can and hopefully by having them ahead of time you can mark those dates out. If you are looking for them and not seeing them in your materials, um, we will get them to you after the meeting. Uh, the next meeting um, is going to be October the 21st, so um, that one for sure, um, please, if you could make a note of that, but we will, we will give you all of those dates. Um, by the way, um, I'm referring to, and you will see that the members of the committee have uh, a binder uh, in front of them. Uh, the materials are um, pretty much uh, those that have already been made available through the website, but the entire binder uh, in electronic form um, will be available um, hopefully by the end of today. We were having technical difficulties yesterday, um, but we have the National Action Plan, a few related materials, um, the text of the Freedom of Information Act, a compilation of OGIS recommendations to improve FOIA, which is part of our mission. Um, we have the charter for this committee. Uh, we have a number of documents related to the Federal Advisory Committee Act, uh, including uh, the final rule issued by the General Services Administration. Um, we have a committee membership list and biographies. Uh, those, uh, again, are available on the website. And then we have the agenda and logistics um, uh, materials for today. So um, no mystery there. That's what's, in, that's, what's in the <laughs> that's what's in the binders. What I'm realizing that um, may not be in the binders yet is the information on the handout that has the tentative uh, future meet meeting dates. So look no further. We will get those to you um, when we have our break, members. Um, we are going to be drafting um, and developing uh, bylaws for the committee. Um, that is a task that the committee uh, will need to turn to, uh, mainly to flesh out some of the operating procedures such as um, are already laid out in the charter, 
um, and we will will be working on that. Just a reminder, uh, I don't probably need to remind anybody of this, but um, because we're dealing with the Freedom of Information Act, our interest is uh, very strongly that of making sure that um, not only that we have an open meeting, but the materials um, and the way we operate are as transparent and open as we possibly can. Um, I think that we have a number of people um, who have been uh, following uh, the setting up of the committee, who are very interested in the proceedings, and between the committee members themselves who are dedicated to this process and those of you who are going to be contributing in other ways, I am sure that if there is any way in which we are not as open as we um, need to be, you will not let us down. You will let us know. Um, and we will, uh, we, we will hear you and try and rectify that. But just do know that we are trying, we're trying to do that, but for those of us, um, none of us on the committee have previously served on a federal advisory committee, and uh, we, are, we are learning a bit as we go. It's an interesting, interesting process. Um, also, um, we are working on developing a collaborative workspace. Um, we haven't quite got that uh, down yet, but we're trying to do that. That's something that would need to be open uh, to all the members. Um, there, are some, there are some difficulties we found with agencies not necessarily using the most up-to-date information technology, so, <laughs> so that, um, I know that's a shock. <laughs> Um, David Reed, for example, from the FCC, has um, started the process of trying to set up a, a collaborative workspace for us. David, thank you for that. I, I don't think we have it up and we, we don't necessarily, not necessarily is everyone able to, to access this. I think it was going to be a Google. Well, I put it up as a straw man to let everyone see uh, what's going to be our needs. We're working on that. So uh, we will. We'll, we'll keep everybody in, informed on that. Um, and of course, we're gonna wanna listen to uh, those of you who are in the room. We have set aside uh, a portion of the meeting at the end um, to uh, get public comments, um, but I know that also you will not hesitate to, to talk to any of us, to talk amongst yourselves, to talk to your colleagues, um, and we want to hear the good ideas that all of you have. Um, a reminder again, this is a two-year effort. We're not necessarily going to be able to identify every single thing that we want to look at or every single issue today. Um, certainly not solve all of those problems, um, but we are, <laughs> we're going to make a start and um, I think we can make a lot of progress pretty quickly. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is uh, starting with, we're going to be moving into the next part of our meeting with a brainstorming session. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at various projects that we might consider, um, and then we're going to be selecting three projects um, that we are going to focus on. Um, that is going to be an interesting process. Uh, we're going to be led in that by Lynn Overman, who is a senior advisor at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I am as curious as you are to see <laughs> how that works and what we come up with. So, Lynn. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to so turn I'm it over to you. Very pleased to be here today. This is actually something that we do very frequently in the Office of Science and Technology Policy as the way that we can really get everybody creatively brainstorming, identify ideas that you have, but not only what we see with this is what's really great is oftentimes you all will have very similar and overlapping ideas that we can identify through this process, and we like literally put them up on these boards, and then we have these vote. And what we've learned from that is it can help people kind of recognize the commonalities, see where they keep the energy I'm sorry, I can't hear. Apologies. Um, and really come up with some great projects that people are very enthusiastic about it. So we have a few tools of the trade that are actually right in front of you. You have a sticky pad, you have a Sharpie, 
And what we're going to ask you to do first, I'll go over the whole process and then we'll start with the brainstorming. The first step that we will do is we're going to ask you to brainstorm ideas, at least three each, but you can do more if you're feeling energetic this morning. And the only kind of framework we want you to keep in mind is if you can try to bucket them into these three different steps, process, policy, and legislative. <laughs> You may have one or more ideas that kind of cross the boundaries there. If that's the case, if you could write each idea on two separate stickies so that we can put them up. What we're going to do at the end is we will physically place your stickies here and group them, and then we'll vote at the end. So those four red stickers are the stickers that you will use to vote on the ideas that you like the best. You can use all four on one idea if you think it's particularly genius. You can use one per each, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so we're going to give you 10 minutes. You can either write your ideas out, or if you're particularly artistic, you can draw them. Some people like to do that. I am a terrible artist, so I tend to write, and I also have terrible handwriting. So ideas that you think fit into this that would be your top suggestions to improve the FOIA process, policy, or legislative um, fixes that you think are, are required, we'll give you 10 minutes to do that. At the end of 10 minutes, we will come back and ask each of you to do a rapid pitch out of your ideas, and we'll see what we come up with. So we're going to go ahead and start right now. And if anyone has any questions, now is the time to ask. All right, great. Go ahead. How would you like for us on the phone to participate in this part? <laughs> I, f I apologize, I forgot about the folks on the phone. The folks on the phone, um, especially the one with the two-year-old, have him do your drawing for you. Um, but if you just want to go ahead and write down uh, your ideas or, or figure out, we'll ask you to share them on the phone and then perhaps someone here can actually just jot them down on the sticky pad for us and we can make sure that we include your ideas on the boards as well. Okay, so we should write them down now and then someone will ask us about our ideas later. Is that the, exactly. the plan? Yes, that is what okay. we will do. So okay, you, 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 are, you are thinking and writing for the next 10 minutes. I'm always thinking and writing. OK. And you can use crayons if you want. <laughs> yes, and the instructions are you can use crayons if you like. Perfect.
minute warning, everyone. I know 10 minutes feels like a long time, right? <laughs> Did we have somebody join on the phone in the last few minutes? Yeah, that was me, Andrew Better. Oh, Andrew, great. We, we're glad to have you back. Good, I'm just having some technical difficulty though with my internet connection. Okay, well hang in there and did you hear the instructions about uh, coming up with some ideas for improving for you? Yeah, it sounds like my minutes are almost up. Okay. Thank you. all know who's leading our open government efforts um, be our runner so who should we pick on first should we start on this end sure oh of course I've started on the opposite end from where Corey is <laughs> so you want start with your first idea we'll go through something I've been advocating for your uniform fees for FOIA processing ah, and which bucket would that go in uh, it's does it require legislation or is that a policy? I don't know. What do you think, Beth? I mean, it's probably both. Okay. I'd say both. both. All right. I mean, because I guess OMB could say that the fees across boards are X because they do have the, the guide, but. All right. What else we got? Second one, something uniform regulations. It'd be nice if the public had one, one set of regulations. That's policy, All clearly right. policy. Third one, clearly legislation. Uh, those of us know we have 20 working days to process requests. Simple requests are probably easily processed in 20 days. Some of these requests, if it takes us six months to process, the public's happy. However, the statute says we have 20 days to process, so maybe some way of saying uh, simple requests, maybe 20 days. If it's a complex request, maybe 60 days. I'm, I'm just throwing numbers out. And the last one, which you probably all guess, some kind of consolidated FOIA portal, <laughs> location, <laughs> repository. Some place where the public to go one place and get submit their request, process. agency process, process their request, and receive their records electronically. That's a popular one, I can tell you already. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thorough study of agency FOIA backlogs, cost, effect, solutions. All right. That sounds like policy, process. right? Mm -hmm. Process? Process or policy? I think it's probably both, but. We'll put um, it on the edge here. I'll leave that to you. Harnessing technology government-wide, what's available, how can it best be used? That sounds like process and also related to the single portal, but not exactly the same. Um, related to, gear, uh, to um, fee policy, how evaluating and fixing it, and that's probably legislative and uh, just like Larry said. Um, I took the liberty of doing a couple extras. Okay, developing cross-training for agency FOIA personnel and requesters. That would be process. Um, and building in a permanent role for requesters and formulating FOIA policy. That would be policy. Awesome. Great. All right, moving on. All right, so I have, uh, I have technology uh, for process, uh, specifically even searching. We, we talk about emails and we've heard about emails, um, so things like that. So how do we leverage technology to do that efficiently, effectively, and quickly? Um, for, I think this is policy, but um, agency training and education, not just FOIA professionals, but every employee. Um, how do people respond to FOIA? Usually not very well. Uh, you know, I have to do this. Do I really have to do it? What do I need to do? Um, but understanding what, the, what is FOIA and what do they have to do? Um, 
policy or process? I think it's policy oh. because I can talk about it all day long, yep. but I need a little bit more than, than just my words, so yep. to speak. Uh, and then I have more <laughs> oversight. Um, I think this is probably, I don't know if it's policy or legislative, but more oversight, expanding DOJ's role and OGIS's role, but also audits, being a more proactive. Are agencies doing what they're supposed to um, uh, and be consistent versus just the annual report? Great. I'm going to put this kind of on the edge between these two. Okay. All right. Okay. I've got increasing or and or restoring public confidence uh, in the system, particularly through enhanced communications between the agencies and requesters. Some agencies are fantastic. Some agencies, after doing this even for 20 years, won't return my damn phone calls. <laughs> Where do we that's that? Policy. Yes, or, I feel process. like that's related. Or process. Proce process. Process. I think it's process. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's. I think that's related to an earlier suggestion on cross training for. Okay. One of the things we always hear is, as it's easy for us as lawyers to file our own FOIA lawsuits, doesn't sway me in the slightest, but for most people who use it, litigation is, is very expensive and difficult and not something they know. So creation of an independent authority that can adjudicate the disputes between the, in, the agencies administratively, and it could just be giving more teeth to OGIS the way some, some countries have actual ombudsmen. Interesting. Great. That sounds like policy, and it seems related policy to this. Policy, it may be legislative, too. So we'll put it in this little corner here oversight and independence authorities. Okay. And then the third one is somewhat of an echoing of what we've heard already, enhancement of the online capabilities such as tracking progress. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I feel like there are going to be a few stickies in that space. Okay, moving on. Okay, uh, my first one is to develop an avenue to access immigration records that is outside FOIA and or simplify the FOIA process to access yeah. these records because there's several departments that deal with huge numbers of requests for these records. Do we think that's policy or process? Mm -hmm. A little bit of both. Yeah, I think it is. I, I think more policy, but. Okay, we'll put it here. Okay. Um, I also have build a stronger bridge between FOIA and records management and mandate annual training in both areas for federal employees. Excellent. That matches this. Okay. And then I have create standard performance criteria for federal employees that address FOIA and records management responsibilities. Excellent. So I feel like that's a little between more oversight and kind of consistent agency training. Okay. All right. Um, I took your mandate and ran with it. So I have aim for one year max for every request. Okay. That's a good rule of thumb. One Similar, way to do that. Do we want to put that in kind of legislative related to the I would say process. process? But might bleed in. Uh, one way to do that is to improve the referral process. Some of our 20-year-old requests are 20 years old because of the referral product. Wow. Okay. Um, increase discretionary releases. Everyone talks about it. I'd like to see it happen more. That includes um, B5 exemptions and the ODNI actually said a quote in the Sunshine Week that said, "Not should we, not can we withhold, but should we?" I'd like to see that used more. Excellent. That uh, sounds. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you decide. Where okay. <laughs> Policy, I guess, sure. Yeah. Um, I have um, reduced fee animosity, like Larry was talking about. Animosity. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put that in. I could have, but I would have thought about it. I'm, I'm outside the government, I can say that. <laughs> we said that that was crossing both, so I'll put that sure. one on the policy side. Uh, something that we've kicked around a long time is a litigation review, and I, we think there are some FOIA cases in the courts right now that could be dismissed. Oh, interesting. Um, the memo yesterday, the Department of Justice, to their credit, said we're not going to appeal, we're going to release it. Um, but they could have done that earlier, in our opinion. Interesting. Um, uh, I would say that's probably policy. Yeah, I think that's in the cloud of the oversight, independent authority, and kind of proactive. <laughs> um, and then related so to that, I would also say get the Department of Justice, not OIP, the um, civil division to think long and hard before defending FOIA withholdings. So maybe have tougher discussions with agencies saying we're not going to withhold that or we're not going to defend that in court, you have to release it. Or maybe tie an OGIS. And then last, sorry guys, um, post exponentially more FOIA releases online and move it so that the default is posting the releases online. Excellent. And, and if I, from the profit. perspective of our uh, chief technology officer, I would just caveat this with 
making it machine readable so it's oh, easier yeah. to search and people can pull and share as they please. Yep. Um, I'm going to add another to reforming. I put the word reform. I'm not sure if that's the right one for fees and fee waivers. Excellent. Um, and um, this is a crazy one, but revise the statute in plain writing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's I feel like this is going to get a lot of votes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, just a thought. Um, on the process side, I think this um, fits in with some of the others, but building accessibility into IT procurement, and that would work for FOIA and for records management issues. So a little bit related. Um, That's crazy talk. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just I was just saying procurement reform is crazy talk. This is Clay Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put so, that right next to plain language. So maybe I maybe I have a buddy on that. Um, another one um, that's sort of legislative but could be policy is reducing and clarifying exemption three statutes, which are the statutes that prohibit. Release of information. Um, here's a process one. Um, having some sort of a triage system at agencies for tasking searches so that records are not disposed of or lost while pending in a queue. Oh, interesting. Do you think that's policy or process? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's both, probably. Um, and um, this one, I guess, is process, uh, which is standardizing FOIA websites. Um, and I, I just do want to mention, and I know you all uh, are, are aware of this, but I want to say it, say it in case people are not. Remember, I mentioned in the beginning, um, in the introduction, that uh, this advisory committee is one of a number of initiatives under the Open Government national action plan of the, U the U.S. government. And some of the things that have been mentioned are projects that are underway, having a common rule or regulation, um, having a, 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 a one, uh, one inter what is the, the consolidated <laughs> website uh, for making requests. So those are things that I think uh, everybody recognizes and tra uh, training as well. Those are all, um, those are all in the works. So I think my three are process. I'm going to pile on with the single point of access and a central repository that's searchable. Um, architectural standards for data and documents, including machine readability. Yay, thank you. <laughs> uh, and then uh, lastly, establishing a set of metrics and benchmarks that track transparency and the efficacy of the process so that there's visibility into how agencies are performing and yep. how requesters are requesting. Excellent. My first one is improving uh, the ability of agencies to proactively post information by simplifying or possibly modifying Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act to make posting easier. Legislative? That's probably legislative. Yeah. Um, and then improving the ability of the public to gain access to proactively disclosed information by greater utilizing metadata tagging. These are all words we love. <laughs> <laughs> and then building on that even more, improving both the quantity and the quality of what is proactively disclosed by moving beyond FOIA offices and having greater engagement across the agency. And then my last one is um, expanding the use of IT tools to help agencies achieve greater efficiencies in actual processing of records. That actually sounds a little different from the yeah. portal piece, right? Yes, yeah. yes, it's more tools so for it's the more processing. So it's more for agencies, right? Yeah. Great. Well, I'm embarrassed because mine are somewhat parochial and the word historian is in a lot of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> we need those perspectives. Well, yeah. Um, one would be to aggregate, aggregate FOIA requests by topic to identify subjects that can be prioritized for processing and release. So if 
the Department of Energy is getting FOIA requests on one topic and if you had somewhere to track them by subject area. Great, I don't that know actually that's, was, that's the metadata. I don't know if that's Maggie. a dream, but. <laughs> Um, some agencies have history departments, not a lot of them, but they do, but FOIA, agent, FOIA officers at agencies with history offices should engage them and seek advice on requests. So again, they can help out with maybe finding the records faster than if it's just done haphazardly. Um, and the other one would be to have your office, OGIS, work closely with the National Declassification Center to develop processes to expedite declassification. Thank you. Uh, I have one that clusters with the uh, suggestions regarding metadata. Uh, this is to design record systems for easier and more accurate redaction. And I say this is actually broader mm -hmm. than metadata and automated systems. I think it extends even to the design of paper forms, which unfortunately a lot of agencies are still using, um, that we should be looking every time we set up a record for what are we gonna do when the time comes to release it? Have we determined what is or isn't releasable? Um, I have two that cluster, I guess, with the suggestions about oversight. Uh, one is to improve the accuracy of agencies' FOIA work hour reports. I don't think we actually have good information about how much time is spent, excuse me, processing um, responses. Uh, and then the second is to audit a sample of FOIA responses for proper disclosure. Right now, in general, we just rely on respondents' uh, protests, uh, appeals, uh, as quality control, but A, respondents don't always have the resources to appeal, and B, there are some mistakes that respondents don't have an incentive to appeal. So we should be doing our own quality control. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then finally, just, uh, just adding a vote to all the previous suggestions with regard to proactive disclosure. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, the public should be able to see what their government's records are without the requester or the agency going through the expense and delay of a FOIA request. The information in general should just be out there for people to look at. All right, onward. Uh, this one is a policy suggestion. Uh, proactively disclose popular classes of documents, for instance, contracts, congressionally mandated reports. Um, use an audit either of a year worth of FOIA requests or six months worth of FOIA requests to, to identify what are popular do document sets um, and then prioritize those for proactive disclosure. Uh, this one is legislative. Uh, legislate for more funding or shift funding internally within the agency to give FOIA offices more resources to hire and invest in new technology sort of aiming for the stars here. <laughs> uh, and while we're at it, while we're, while we're aiming high and being aspirational, uh, a legislative fix, I think, uh, a B-5 exemption balancing test, foreseeable harm of disclosure versus the public interest in disclosure. Uh, another legislative fix here, um, to create a unique identifying phrase that al allows advocates and interested parties to identify and track B-3 bills as they move through Congress. Oh, uh, this is a process. Your hashtag. Or, yes, that would be nice. Uh, this is a process or policy suggestion. Uh, greater outreach, especially via phone and email, to requesters to work with them on ways to narrow requests. I think this would help to whittle down the backlog, get more things into the simple track instead of the complex track. Um, and another policy fix or potentially legislative. Uh, presumptively include all IRS designated 501c3 organizations as educational or, no, or non-commercial requesters for favored fee status. Well, since I was at the end, I knew there'd be no white space left up there <laughs> after this group. Uh, we so still we have, have some three. room. You're um, not needed to remember the people on the phone. We, yes. We, yes. we are not gonna forget you. No. You're, I'm, not, you're, I'm at the line. Uh, uh, actually, not uh, virtually. 
Uh, the first is the legislative. It's been uh, uh, mentioned several times. Uh, revise or eliminate fees, at least for non-commercial requesters. Uh, look at seriously what we have there. Commercial requesters will let them keep paying. Uh, the next one, uh, sort of in between policy and process, uh, uh, promote more interagency interaction, uh, excuse me, agency interaction between FOIA and open government slash transparency offices. Uh, in the DOD, we, and we're right now planning and hopefully within the next six months have my office uh, in the same office with transparency open government. But that's not true to all agencies. And, you know, for those of us in FOIA, our mandate is what the FOIA is. It's not, you know, the proactive disclosure is not part of what we do necessarily. So some kind of direction to get agencies interacting more in, in, that, in that regard. And uh, the last one I have is, is policy moving into process and uh, uh, um, sort of building on what Ginger said about uh, proactively disclosing contracts. Part of the problem is we don't have a process to determine what is uh, uh, commercially confidential or not. You, you have Executive Order 12600 if a request comes in. But, you know, you, you have no other process if you say, okay, I've got a contract I want to proactively disclose to, to deal with line item. Uh, so some kind of process that is developed uh, that, that, uh, that can facilitate a proactive disclosure of, of ish items in uh, contracts. That's all I have. Great. All right, so we'll turn to the folks on the phone. I'm going to need someone in the room who writes quickly and neatly. Ah, Corey, excellent. Um, so we will be taking down your ideas and we will be putting them up on our ever-filling boards here. So why don't we start with Dave? All right, thanks. Um, everybody is, uh, I, my whiteboard in my mind has been filled in by all the great suggestions. But one thing I, I haven't heard is um, actually the first one on my list, which is to increase the cultural professionalism for non-Beltway FOIA staff. Uh, that's, uh, for those of us out in the hinterlands, that, that's the big issue. Um, somebody else mentioned uh, providing teeth for OGIS, which I uh, heartily endorse. That's great folks, but um, don't have any mechanism to actually make the agencies uh, do anything. And uh, somebody else also mentioned, uh, I think the term was to reduce fee animosity, which I love. Um, that's a big issue uh, for the requesters. And um, I would like to highlight that. All right, we'll put a plus one next to that. Yay. Great, is that all? Is that oh, it? Yeah. Yes, that's it. Excellent. <laughs> Okay. Our other phone representatives? How about uh, Andrew? I think you're, we're going to stick with alphabetical. Sure. Um, I, I also have to echo um, a lot of suggestions pertaining to the machine readability, the standardization. So I'll throw out a couple other ideas. Um, one would be a pro be pro process. Uh, I think generally a better, this falls under customer service, I think, a better mechanism for communicating. Um, with a uh, FOIA officer, and specifically uh, um, have it person at the end of the line or the hand. So uh, there can be better communication um, if there is issues around narrowing the request, things of, of that nature. Um, and Andrew, legis Andrew, 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 this is Miriam. I I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. you're, br you're breaking up a little bit. Is yeah. there, is it your connection or? Is there any way you okay. can? Okay. Thanks. It is probably my connection to me. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. um, I could. I could also. Is that? I think we captured it. We're we're right, good. We're good. Emails in. Continue. Uh, okay. Um, sure. Under this is uh, under legislative. I would say more oversight. Uh, again, I agree about the DJ role and having more teeth to play. Um, and then finally, and finally under um, this process or policy, greater transparency in the FOIA pro in the handling of FOIA in terms of who, what, um, how, and, and why are things searched internally. Um, just so uh, the requester can be ensured that uh, um, whatever records he, she seeking, um, there's been a, a thorough search and there's accountability in that search.
And Andrew, I think it wouldn't hurt for you to, to maybe send those, yeah. if you would just send those to us in writing as well, because you were breaking up there. Certainly, happy to. Thanks. Clay? Hi there. Uh, so I've got three ideas. The first one is legislative, but it's really just a plus one to, um, to doing something with 508 compliance. My idea would be a, you know, uh, three-year 508 exemption for, um, for FOIA documents, because uh, I generally think a lot of stuff that's uh, a bit older is almost impossible to ensure 508 compliance, some of the stuff that's sort of pre-internet um, uh, especially. Um, so coming up with, with some way to, um, to, to get FOIA, FOIA documents outside of the 508 stuff is, is important. Uh, the second one is probably the only idea that hasn't come up yet, uh, which is um, uh, standard redaction technology. It seems like redaction, uh, especially of, of personally identifiable information, um, is one of the big holdups uh, around this stuff. And uh, so uh, developing, uh, I know, it, you know, my firm, we, we work a lot with open data stuff. Uh, when I was at Sun, when I was director of Sunlight Labs, we worked a lot with open data stuff, and we made it, uh, you know, relatively uh, cheap. We scan a bunch of documents and identify social security numbers in a bunch of PDFs, and uh, and redact those um, those uh, that personally identifiable information. So I think that that kind of technology needs to be encouraged, developed, and centralized. And the government, speaking of centralized inside of government. My third thing is, and I, you know, I'm probably going to take the radical approach here, is I will probably be the only person on this committee that vehemently opposes, opposes a sort of centralized repository of FOIA documents with a singular search interface, because I think that the federal government historically has a really bad track record of developing centralized tools. Um, uh, of that regard, and we can we can see from from healthcare.gov or sam.gov, or I can spend all day listing off those sort of centralization efforts and how they fail. And instead, um, what we should be aiming for is a standard set of FOIA protocols that are vendor requirements, a, a bunch of open APIs um, that um, that are well documented, that are vendor requirements uh, uh, from the that are implementing FOIA technology inside of, of agencies. And if those um, APIs are developed right, then we have all kinds, we will have all kinds of uh, central repositories and the, and the FOIA request can go to the right place and the FOIA responses um, can be indexable, crawlable, and findable, uh, especially and specifically for the public where they search for the most, which isn't on FOIA.gov, it's, it's on Google. Um, so I think we in this committee need to not be thinking about how do we invent Google but for FOIA, but instead think about how do we get FOIA documents into Google. Um, and uh, and uh, so there's a um, set of protocols now that are mainly for service requests into government um, called Open 311. And so I'd like to see an Open 311 set of protocols but for FOIA uh, developed. So those would be my three big ideas. Great. Okay. Is that everyone? Okay. Uh, gonna... No, uh, Maggie. Oh, sorry. One more. One more. Hi. Um, I guess I'll start with policy. Um, I don't know if I'm the only person who's um, representing a higher education full time, but since I teach for it and since it's um, it's an interesting process to teach students how to get how, what their rights are, number one, and that they, they should be perfectly asking for government information. I'd like to see more either student representation or um, student input into this whole process since we're training the next generation of journalists and policymakers and educators. Um, I'm not really sure what the whether or not any students applied for these positions, or I'd, I'd like to talk about that, but how we can use universities and 
and secondary schools to um, promote open government is important to me. Um, whether or not at some point we should have a FOIA move for um, some sort of online education uh, module to come out of this, this committee would be interesting. Um, so that was my idea about policy, was, you know, including the student component into it somehow. Um, on process, I'm probably just repeating what other people have said, but the elimination of paper, <laughs> this is as simply as I can state it. I mean, they're just, I recently got some documents from a, a year after I filed a, a FOIA request from federal government. Um, paper documents and the elimination of papers is something that I struggle with all the time as both a working journalist and as a teacher. And again, you know, given the open source tools and the code that's the, the possible code that could be written to get some of these records. For example, I have a computer science student at BU right now who's been scraping state websites um, fairly easily, and I just think that there can be some better ways that technology can be integrated into, into the whole FOIA process and getting records. So I'd like to talk more about that. Um, and then on um, legislative and oversight, I'd be curious to know um, what we could do from this committee top down to educate state, state lawmakers about FOIA, I'm just speaking from Massachusetts, which does not have a strong public records law. In fact, probably one of the worst, according to the Center for Public Integrity, State Integrity Study that was done last year, uh, which my students and I did the reporting on, and we got an F in uh, open government issues in Massachusetts. And I, I would like to see more education of state lawmakers on the meaning of open government and how the federal federal government is dealing with this, i.e. this committee. Um, and then I would also, just on oversight, it would be someone mentioned earlier the cost of the cost of um, denying access. I would like to see at some point a quantification of and whether this could be an ongoing quantification of the cost to um, prevent access to records, and if, if there's any way that we could assess how much the government is spending to deny records, whether um, you know it's an assessment of how much it's costing for a lawyer to do redactions or paying outside counsel, but it would be really helpful, I think, to look at this in terms of, of money spent and probably a very big project, but I, I would be curious to see it. I mean, in Massachusetts, for example, we tried to see, um, we, we tried to look at um, government spending on stealing records um, in federal court, and, um, and we weren't able really to get the information, which I can another time, but just in a numbers, and I, I'd like to see what these are at some point. So that's it. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. okay. All right, so we have everyone's input. Um, I did my best to cluster them because um, I want to just kind of walk through the clusters of ideas that I think we've all heard as we've gone through the process. In this way, if you want to vote on kind of a broad cluster as opposed to a specific idea, you can kind of put your dots in the middle of them. I'm gonna caveat at the beginning, Miriam uh, pointed out that there are some projects that are already underway that it may not make sense for you guys to take on as an independent project, but to help um, be, be sure that this committee is informing those projects. That would be the online portal. So I tried to cluster the things that, uh, the suggestions that were made that I think fall pretty squarely into that spot and the uniform regulations, so I think it may make sense to kind of set those aside so that you guys can focus on things that aren't already underway, obviously recognizing we want your input on that. Um, so just to clarify the voting process, you all have your four stickers, you all get to vote. 
the top three projects are going to be the projects that you all will then brainstorm further on and kind of take on as the projects that you'll move forward with. So it actually, you guys did a fantastic job. A lot of these really clustered in kind of uh, topic areas that were really interesting. A lot of energy around proactive disclosure and a lot of really great suggestions about ways that that could be improved. There were some really um, kind of interesting notions on IT tools specifically for the government. I heard this in two different ways. One for kind of the internal processing and uh, efficiencies within government, and then also how that can be used externally as well for people to uh, more easily search, prioritize, and kind of get the information out to the public in a way that makes more sense and is a lot easier to uh, access. Heard a lot of really, uh, there was a lot of uh, energy around fees. We ended up putting it on both sides, but if you want to, we can just pick whichever one you want. If you want to vote, I suggest that we vote kind of one fee project and then figure out how that could cross both legislative and policy. Uh, a lot of heat and energy around more oversight and kind of figuring out where that should land, if it should be OGIS, if it should be DOJ, um, but kind of a more formal oversight authority that would cross the federal government. But then related, but I think pretty separate, is also how we can increase kind of metrics, transparency, uh, auditing, and accountability within government so that we're tracking our programs, making sure that they're actually doing what we think they're supposed to do, and figuring out how we can improve them. Um, there was also kind of an internal agency focus on training and kind of increasing uh, communication, understanding, and FOIA, uh, uh, FOIA as a kind of a cross-agency issue as opposed to just FOIA offices and open government advocates. And then there was a lot of energy around uh, figuring out ways that we can more effectively communicate with the requester community, both kind of on the policy side of the shop, but also in the process of uh, requests so that we can try to eliminate or narrow them down in a way that makes the most sense. So we clustered those together. There were a few that kind of were individual, and I think the legislative ones by their very nature, I'm sorry, um, were a little bit more independent, so I left those separate. And I think, and another thing, just I can confess as a lawyer, I found the litigation review, actually, I thought that that was worth its own little bucket. Um, it may make sense to fold that in either on kind of the accountability side, perhaps on the oversight side, <clears throat> so it could fit, but I do think this kind of proactive notion of taking a hard look, um, both at the cases that are currently in the court and also ones that we're contemplating defending could be a really interesting piece as well. So now uh, what we're gonna ask you to do is take those precious four red dots Yes. The one other national action plan commitment that we, you didn't mention at the beginning that we are already working on is training. Oh, excellent. So a whole training series of, of modules for FOIA professionals and non. So that there okay. are actually that needs to be in the same category as the regs. Excellent. And consolidate it. All right. So I'm going to pull out the only one that I think doesn't solidly fit in the training is more ongoing interaction between FOIA and open government transparency offices. So I'll put that up here. So great, so we already have things that are in process that we can inform, so if you could go ahead and vote, then we will. Uh... So we have 20 minutes to vote and take a break. Okay, so let's. How do, how, do, how do the people on the phone get to vote? They can let us know if they have a question. Okay, all right, so we'll. Do we have email? We'll do practice. We can email Crystal. Okay, all right. So for those of you on the phone, if you could send an email to Krista, and let her know how you want to vote. We will take that. Okay. How do, how do we do this? Great. So you'll have 20 minutes. You just physically walk up and place your stickers where you want. And then, well, is the break built into that 20 minutes? Yes. Great. So the faster you vote, the longer time off you have. <laughs> so, that, so that means that we will take a break and come back here at 11. 11.35, that's a little more than 15 minutes, but um, 11.35, good? Okay. We are. Okay, oh, do you wanna take a picture?